Sonny Webster, welcome back. Mate, thank you. Only two months. Mate, it's fucking been ages since I last seen you. I haven't actually caught up with you that much at all. You were like, let's catch up. I was like, let's do a podcast. Yeah, mate. Buzzing to be back. So how long have you been back in Sydney? Mate, only about a day and a half. But the first day I got back just felt so weird. Like, I didn't feel settled at all. I was like, am I meant to be here? And I was saying to Callum, it was like the first time in ages that we've actually travelled to somewhere and it not been somewhere new or that I haven't been since pre-pandemic. So I think that was the key thing that was kind of making it feel really weird. And like, I didn't really know whether I wanted to be home or not. That's weird. How was the UK? UK was incredible. I think like, because I hadn't been back for two years, I didn't expect the seminars to blow like they did. And just standard sunny crammed so many things into such a short period of time that we were just go 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 and you never really got a chance to actually settle and enjoy where we were but the people were incredible yeah i forget how young you are 28 i turned 28 when i was in the uk mate like i don't mean to you know get in your head but you got two more years work hard because when you're <laughs> my age mate 32 and a half it starts starts getting more difficult so we have the fair points podcast together which we do we only did one episode when you weren't here We've done a couple of podcasts back in the inception, but I thought it'd be a good opportunity for you to actually tell your story in like a minute or less for people that might be listening to this for the first time. Yeah, I mean, going back 11 years old, started Olympic weightlifting, fast forward 10 years of deliberate practice and really hard work, made the Olympics in 2016, got banned in 2017. Again, completely unknowingly, you definitely need to go and listen to that podcast if you haven't, because it's an absolute rocker. Um, and then since then, set up four businesses, travelled around the world, delivered 137 seminars face-to-face -face, um, with over 20,000 people and run one of the largest weightlifting communities now in the world and launched the Mobility Manual app just recently. So. When did this guy get media training, by the way? Do you know when that, when that fucking happened? 60 Mate, seconds. They're sick. That was, uh, that was pretty good because it gets sometimes confusing knowing your own story. Do you mm. ever find that like you sit in your life, you're like, what am I? Yeah, well, I think a big part of that is, especially being an athlete, you identify with being a sports person for so long. And, you know, if you'd asked me this question seven years ago, or eight years ago, it would have just been weightlifting is my life, you know, whereas since then now the importance changed and you have to find a, a new identity of what you do, you know, it's, I'm sure you felt the same, like your daily jobs now aren't the same as when you're a PT and you're going in and training people, you're now content creating and running a business. It's a very different lifestyle for me as well now, you know. Um, I'm much more involved now with my partner and my businesses and the day-to-day -day stresses of running them that, yeah, training is now a luxury escape from <laughs> from the real world. Mate, I have it where I did a few personal training sessions when I was back in London. Having to access that part of my brain felt harder. Like, it, it, I hadn't got the repetitions that I had before when I was on the floor. Also... I look at my physique sometimes and I'm so much less trained in weights because I do so much less weights. Mm. And I'm like, back in the day, worked in the gym, oh, cancellation, I'm getting paid 50 quid to train for an hour. Yeah. Now suddenly you're trying to fit things in and like you say, running multiple businesses, it's stressful. 100%. Not, not to mention, like people can see the, the good side of it and go, oh, it's okay for you. You know, you're laying down on a plane. Be like, yeah, if I stop working in a month's time, I've got nothing. Yeah, I mean, I totally resonate with that. And for me, more than anything, over the last few months has been some of the most stressful months of business that I've ever had. And at times, I'd say it was very far from enjoyable. And I think that's the perception that a lot of people have sometimes when they follow your story through social media to kind of believe that everything is going really well and you've got everything under control but there's been so many moments where i'm running my hands through my hair and my hair's falling out again and i'm like <laughs> fuck <laughs> man i see some of your like trips where i see right sonny's on a plane back to the uk two days later he's back in bali i'm not i'm not messaging this guy because he must be fucked why why was there who first of all who organizes your diary me that's why that's why you're <laughs> fucked yeah basically i'll go bali for a bit come back what was uh what was it like going into bali anyway so like a lot of people are sure like is it open is it not mate you wouldn't believe the amount of questions that people had around bali when we touched down there obviously for us as well from the uk and anyone in australia bali is like the destination that you want to be at especially if you're into fitness and when we touched down there we were really unsure of what it was going to be like but they had it so fucking organized for a country that when there's a road 
works going on they just fucking stand out and wave and don't crash into the fucking hole or they put a palm tree in front of the, <laughs> the ditch in the hole they had the organization incredible you went in you sat down filled out a few forms had your test and then paid for your visa and you were out within half an hour but for the first two weeks that we were there it was like a ghost town it was we were struggling for a beer on a wednesday night really? whereas normally you were inundated with options so it was very quiet for those initial couple of weeks. And then for the final two weeks, it was like, bang. Shortcut was rammed, super busy. All the places were bopping again. There's a load of Russians that just moved to Changu, 20,000 in Changu alone. So it's a very different place than it was than we were pre-pandemic. Still was enjoyable? Yeah, 100%. Uh, took a while to settle in, but for me... Getting into a routine in Bali, training at Wanderlust, eating the good food that you do, um, sleeping well is amazing. And I think it's, it's exactly what I needed after the app launch. It's, a, it's got a really fucked time zone when you're looking at like the UK. So it's awful time zone. Then your TikTok algorithms are fucked because it's geographical. Then like there's so many things wrong with Bali. But I think for someone who's quite nomadic, it's such a good place to heal. You wake up, do your training, relax, nap, get food, sunset, bosh. Yeah, well, it's the fundamental things that you mentioned there, sunshine, sleep, good food that you don't realize, especially when you're an extremely high functioning person, you still lose track of those core values that actually make you feel good and keep your body healthy. And barley does service all those abilities. Mate, and then just as you start getting a bit fat, barley belly. <laughs> Did you get the shit? Tactical, tactical shredding. Yeah, first three days, standard. Mate, just like shitting through the eye of a needle. Yeah, but I didn't actually lose any fucking weight in Bali because I swear, because the food's so good, you're like, oh, I'm going to eat all this healthy food, but you're still consuming too many fucking calories. Too many calories, <laughs> mate. Just before the pandemic, I was out there and uh, I remember we were like ordering for a group of people and I was like, oh, okay, might get a salmon salad. There was no salad on the table. Then no one ate it. So me and this other girl, I was like, oh, we'll eat it. That was what gave me Bali belly. Mate, 100%. If there's two things to avoid when you go to Bali, it's fucking lettuce leaves and ice cubes. Avoid those two things, you'll be okay. Sick. Now you're back. What's on the agenda? Mate, since I've been back, I think that I've had a lot of teething problems with work. Like over the last four months, we've really expanded our team and we're taking on a lot more staff. And it's been like a massive learning curve for me to kind of get everyone to gel and the business to keep performing. Like I liken it to this. The mobility manual, how we had it previously, and the Sunny Webster Academy, how we had it previously, were two small machines, but they were extremely efficient and did extremely well. Now we've invested in the app, two, a bigger machine, the lifting zone, bigger machine, but they're not fucking working right now. And it's having making me having to use my brain a little bit more to get these bigger machines oiled and working well again. So it's it's been stressful, but... I'm already getting a little bit like of anxiety about America because I'm here for three weeks and then I'm planning a two month tour in America. So, yeah, mate, I resonate with that. We moved into these offices like what a month ago. We got to the point where we can't do it all ourselves. It's just me and Sean. So now we're hiring the first people, two people ever. And all they are is, you know, an extra set of brains to help you think about things because at the moment I'm in charge of all the marketing for the business. So if I sleep, nothing gets sold. And it's with the bigger your business, the quicker you go bankrupt. People don't realize that as well. 100%. So, you know, we looked at our year projections. Sean looks at me and goes, well, if we don't improve in the next year, we're going to be in debt. And you're like, wow. And then it's putting the faith in people to do these things for you. But um, you must find that so hard, especially with how strict you are with how you like things that being done. It's a learning curve for me as well, especially with like video editing and getting yeah. things done. Like, for me to send this podcast off to get edited, that in itself, I feel like oh, I, I want to do that. I want to be in control of it. I want to decide how it looks, but I have to let go of these things. Yeah, and one of the best bits of advice I actually got from Sebastian that you spoke to uh, just recently was that when you start employing people, accepting the fact that in your mind, they'll never do the job as well as you could is the best thing. Because other than that, it's like zoning into the fact that they're buying, you're buying your time back by having them completing tasks that really, although even if it's not as good as you could possibly do, it's giving you time spent then on the things that you need to be focusing on. But I think that's one thing. But with when it comes to hiring, also ensuring that the people that you're bringing into the team are bringing in knowledge in areas that you don't currently have. And I've made the mistake in the past of hiring people or bringing people in that don't know because I like them and I want to train them up. But 
essentially you're just going to make another version of you that's potentially not best at doing that task. Maybe we put a job spec out and this one lady emailed me and I showed sure she, she stayed up and made a 30, 60 and 90 day plan for the business. I was like, sure. I didn't even look at her CV. I was like, this is, <laughs> this is the one. And I, I always push things to shore for him to reject me. And he's like, that's our lady. <laughs> I was like, sick. So I'm kind of excited for it, but it does mean as well, you're juggling a few more plates at the same time. And it, it does, people I think can overlook that complex nature of businesses. And I mean, did you have any pushback with any of your events? I, previously, when we've spoken before, without, you know, telling your story for you, you got banned, fought the ban, which if you were guilty, wouldn't really have made sense. I like to exaggerate to people that you could have pleaded guilty, gone back to compete, got caught guilty again, <laughs> and then you would have served a shorter ban than what you're doing now. Now, with that in mind, Weightlifting Federation started trying to stop you from working. Yeah. Do you know what? For this tour, there wasn't any issues, I don't think, for for the whole tour. Didn't hear one bad thing or bad word said. I think finally people are getting around to the fact that just to focus on what they're doing and let me keep doing my, my good work and my God's work. And that, that must feel good because there were times where, you know, you were really pulling your hair out figuratively, literally. There were, all these people are trying to stop you from growing your business. And the thing is as well, you know, you going and doing these seminars, they're as much as like a meeting people face to face and being hands on because it, arguably you could have just saved that last three months, not traveled at all, stayed at home and made more money. Yeah. But it's about getting sunny into these gyms and helping people with their lifts. And I've been coached by you. I'm not even an Olympic lifter. Having five minutes with you changed the majority of my lifts forever. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. And you touched on it a little bit earlier when you were saying about how when you had to do a couple of face-to-face -face sessions and you felt way out of touch because of what you do in your day-to-day -day time. I very much get like that as well when I haven't worked face-to-face -face with people. And for me, it's the thing that I get the most satisfaction out of being there face to face with someone problem solving and helping them correct their basics in their Olympic weightlifting. It then makes me better as an online coach as well, because I have those touch points with people still regularly on a face to face basis. And it helps keep you relevant for sure. We are, I'll, I'll put my hand up and admit guilt that Shaw and I lost a little bit of touch with our client's ability in the sense that our app, we got it audited recently, went to see a user interface team. If you ever need them, they're actually amazing. We had our pants pulled down like for two hours <laughs> and they were like, your app's too complex. There are too many places people can press. They were like, you boys know how a training program looks. Drop set, super set, <laughs> you know, all of these things. They were like, if someone's just come to a training program for the first time. And it was quite humbling to see that, you know, it's hard just to look at people's problems through your lens. And then when you get in front of people again, you can go, oh, do you know what? That's a great bit of content. Yeah, well, this this is the thing. And it's like you said, when you're so involved in, in the trenches with your business every single day, it's very difficult to review things in a sense that you know nothing about it. And we just recently launched a, a new squat program at the Lifting Zone. And I went and looked on the program because I gave it to one of my coaches to write. Uh, or to at least input into the site. And I went on it as though, in my head, I don't know anything about this website or how it works. And I couldn't fucking understand it. And it's so important that when you're like reviewing things, you do exactly like you said on anything that you're putting out, going at it with an approach as though you don't know anything about this site or you've never used it before. And that has a huge impact on the user's experience as well when they're, when they're on your platform. But To any trainers listening to this, if you're thinking of getting an app, what would you tell them? Fucking don't do it. <laughs> I have fucking loads of money. Do you know what? It's building an app. It, you think that's like the pinnacle as an online trainer. That's like the, the final step that's going to take you to the moon from a financial standpoint, but also being able to reach more people. It's extremely hard. And I don't think ours will be like at a point where I'm really happy with it, probably for another two years. But I think accepting that and putting something out there and then constantly refining it as people are using it as you're getting feedback from the people that are actually trying it and then doing your best to keep correcting it is great whereas i think a lot of people when they go about building an app they try and perfect the app at the start and it can be very difficult to do that until you've actually had the user experience feedback something that i realized i drew this in a diagram the other day where i pretty much drew a pyramid and i said that the top 15 percent of people that like your brand are willing to put up with that first two years and they go on it and they go, do you know what? 
this isn't the best interface. This isn't the best technology. This isn't the easiest to use, but I like Sunny. I like why he does what he does and I'm willing to put up with that. Then that 15% actually pay for the development for the next 15%. Then your top 30% of people have just rounded your first two years of business and they pay it on to the people beyond that because we're now four years into having an app. And sometimes I'm, I get disappointed with little bugs we have in the app now. And then Shaw will say to me, two years ago, this was poo. He literally yeah. says that was poo. And then I go, fuck, I'm so grateful to the people that were there in the early stages that put up with that because it could take you with an app seven years before 60, 70% of the people that go on it are actually happy with it. You, you hit, literally hit the nail on the head there. And like you said, those diehard people that love you for, for what you do will put up with it. But the problem is when you initiate and grow an app or create an app, all of a sudden you attract so many more people that don't know you, don't know the story, don't know the hassle that you've gone through to build this. And they come in and they go, this is wank, you know, because they haven't seen that you've only just launched this and it's at the starting point, especially when you're running advertisement for the app. They see the ad, they click on. And if your product isn't working correctly, you can very quickly lose confidence with the market. Um, but yeah, it's interesting you say that about them paying forward for, for the development and the continual growth of the app. And people buy into the brand and that's such a powerful thing because they, yeah, they pave the path for people in the future. But when, then you get yourself in a bit of a predicament where you're like, oh, do I put money into this paid promotions now where only 30% of people will buy or do we wait for two months and then maybe more will buy? And you're playing this really fucked up game that makes it very difficult to know when to put the eggs in your basket and when to move forward with it. How many apps are you juggling now? Well, we've got the the two main platforms, the lifting zone, the mobility manual. But it's interesting that you say that as well. And I said, I, I was actually playing golf this morning with Mark Morano, who's one of the founders of F45. And I was speaking to him about, you know, the direction and growth of a business. And I sat down with my full team um, three months ago when I was in London. And we set all of our goals for the year, for the each quarter. And now, like, and that was expansion growth different sports two months down the line they're completely out the window because we haven't mastered what we were doing really well with just the weight of the mobility manual and things change all the time and i think it's making sure that you consolidate and do your fundamentals and basics really well first before you actually think about that growth element and the expansion some of the results i've seen of people on your mobility manual on your, your adverts are so simple before after i'm like fuck Someone's got a good squat, then, oh my God, they got a great squat. And I, I'm, I'm tempted to do it myself. Yeah, but you probably find the same. And like for us, that's very easy for us to take, you know, inspiration from a before and after of someone's body when they're fat and then they've got a six pack. People buy into wanting the, the outcome rather than necessarily the process because the selling the process isn't sexy because that requires work and dedication from the person. But if you can sell them into the outcome, then they go for it. And it's an easy way to market, yeah. I had a very short stint doing CrossFit. I did enjoy it when I did it. I remember, I'm not going to say their, their name because they're a competitor of yours. It rhymed with Shmom Shmod. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did it every day. And I remember there were other guys in my gym that were doing it and I knew they would be doing it. So I did it as well. Mate, in like three or four weeks, my front squat mobility got so much better that my CrossFit coach at the time was like, you're doing that, aren't you? I said, yeah. He goes, stop doing it before you train. He was like, cause you're dropping real low in these squats. He's like, three weeks ago, you weren't. He was worried I was gonna injure myself. I was like, fuck, three weeks. That's all I've been doing. And Yeah, but this is the thing and it's not necessarily anything that's revolutionary when it comes to mobilizing. The thing where, what the mobility manual does that's different to any other mobility plans out there is it's sport specific and specific to the movement of Olympic weightlifting or to any other given sport. And it's funny that you say that once you've increased the range of motion, that if you don't have strength and stability through that range, that's when you can potentially really injure yourself, which is why a massive part of what I do from a mobility standpoint is once we've increased the range of motion, we then need to strengthen and stabilize it, which is where smart training and the correct loaded exercises will enable you to do that whilst continuing to maintain the range of motion that you have. Because I always assumed you just were naturally mobile, but it's not the case. It definitely helps starting at 11 years old and having trained consistently for so long. 
but I still every single day will when I'm training do exercises that will help strengthen the range of motion I have else I'll lose it you know I stood up on the first tee after not playing golf for, for two months today and going oh fuck me I have to rotate you know because if you're not working through that range of motion over two months of course it's going to stiffen up which is why consistency with anything from that standpoint not only in normal training but in mobility too is so important it's not just a one done one and done thing i've been uh training a lot of jiu-jitsu recently five six seven hours a week and everything's flexion everything's concave everything's rolled forward my level of extension is anything you know there's a mobility test to look at the wall behind you mm -hmm. i can't see it <laughs> And but the thing is, I'm strong through the ranges of motion that I need. Um, but as I start to get older, I'm thinking maybe I need to have a, a, a bigger look at my mobility, not just being sports specific. I need to look into like lifestyle, maybe, you know, <laughs> life mobility, Yeah, a bit of life mobility, because there is going to be a time that maybe I'll get roped into a game of golf. Uh, did you see you saw Darren when you're in Bali? Yeah, it was incredible to, to see him after. Well, I saw him actually in London. He came out for my birthday. So it was really good to see him him there. And you know what? Whenever you see see Darren, he's, he's always the same, going through the trenches with his business, trying to expand and grow. And I think that's our friendship between us three. Obviously, when we first met, we were all in a similar industry. And it's been incredible to see, you know, Darren go and really make his own thing and gain his own identity and his style and his coaching and you know i think he's been doing a great job of it yeah it was when you boys were there in bali i was like fuck i really want to get on a plane but i just kind of built a routine here where i was like i can't leave i can't go just yet i'm going home in three weeks yeah well you you wanted to be back here so bad and then did it, did it feel different for you when you when you did get back here i was so happy to be here like yeah. mate when being outside of australia and not being able to get back in was the worst yeah and there was even times during the UK, I want, you know, you never like to say you're low, but I was like, I'm just, can't, I'm just wasting my life here. Mm. And one of the blatant things was the fact I never bought a coffee table for my front room. So I was eating dinner on my floor every night. And every night I was thinking I should get a coffee table. I was like, but I don't want one. I don't want to live here. And I actually became like a Scrooge of the group. Do you want to come out for drinks? I was like, nah, because I'll be hung over tomorrow. The only way I can enjoy tomorrow less is if I'm hung over. You know, like, <laughs> so, so I barely drank when I was in London, unless it was like a massive event. And people are like, oh, so how are things? I'm like, yeah, I just want to go back to Oz. And then I realized I was pulling people down. I was actually being the downer of the group, going jujitsu. Oh, how was America? You're going to go back? I was like, nah, I just want to go back to Oz. And they're like, oh, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm locked out. I was just moaning all the time. So getting back was amazing. It was everything I thought it was. And like moving back in with the boys, going into my old bedroom. Do you know what? I'm a, I'm a shout them out because I I've, I've didn't actually do it enough. <laughs> Koala, the bed company, when I got back, like, do you want a bed? They redid your room again. Yeah. And I was like, yes, please. They sent me the most expensive bed. And I was like, what's the angle? They're like, just have it. And it's unreal. And they never really got like a massive shout out from me. So Koala, thank you for that. There you go. But getting that, coming back into the house, I was like, this is perfect. But I've still got slight visa issues. Hopefully I'll get a response before 2 million followers. But... <laughs> But I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, I really want just a nice place to live with a big TV and a good sound system. Mm. And I thought, well, that's not going to come true. So I just bought a big TV for the house. <laughs> <laughs> so I got an 85 inch TV for the front room with a sonar sound bar. And I was like, do you know what? Winning. Mate, I've got enough. But obviously you're going back for your next tour. Is Have you got the fears about that and not coming, being able to come back again yet? Uh, no, so basically. It's a bit of a non-start for you not being able to go. It's 100% you're off. Mate, for the for the first time ever, I've got a visa now where I'm stuck in Oz. Yeah. So I have to ask permission to go home, which is an interesting one. Hey, Australian government, can I go see my parents, please? Mm -hmm. Then I go, then I come back. Then technically, even according to their website, I should have a response before tour time. Yeah. Then tour time will happen. Go back, got IFS, there, which I'm buzzing for. IFS is going to be good. I've never been to Lisbon or Portugal. Nor have I. Uh, so the party scene should be pretty decent there. Barcelona was amazing the first year. Yeah, I was trying to explain to Callum what it's, what it's like, and it is just so many fitness people all sending it, and then masses of knowledge bombs. Like Basically, uh, the events team that reached out to me in the onset when I had about 60,000 followers were like, we want to run your events. I was like, what do you do? They're like, festivals. I was like, like music festivals. They're like, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, we do nightclubs, festivals, uh, beer and cider festivals. And I was like, you want to do a fitness event? And festival? when we went to Body Power that first year, rest in peace. 
uh, when we went to Body Power that year, I, uh, they were like, look, we can do this properly. So we put the event together. We did IFS first year, Barcelona. I said to them, I'm going to pick everyone we need. Did like a little group of all our favorite people. And we sent it in Barcelona. It was incredible. But I think that that's what made that initial one so special is because of the friendships that we do have within the within the fitness industry. And there's some great people that all get on and also delivering the same message in their own ways. It makes it a really fun environment for people to be around. And I think for a lot of people that even listen to this, listen to your stuff, million people now <laughs> following your stuff on social media, like they still feel extremely close to you because of the way that you portray yourself on social media and deliver your knowledge. So to get for people to have the opportunity to come to that event and actually spend genuine time with the people that they're inspired by that they love as an educator is a very special thing because you go to most fitness events or fitness expos your hero's on the stage talking and then he's gone mm. whereas here it's very much people are actually interacting with the people that they come to see which makes it a very unique and special event in itself which is why i think so many people love that opportunity to travel and a lot of people that do come to that event, they don't know anyone. So they also get to meet amazing new friends and make new friendships. I think from the first year, we had 75% of people that came solo. And then this year in London, or last year in London, we tried bringing everyone together for it. But it's sick that you'll be doing a lifting workshop in one room. And then there'll be like a business talk with like Paul Moore or someone in another. And we kind of have this weekend of everyone working together. I messaged you about doing a business talk. Yeah. Keen to do it? 100%. I'll be keen to do a business court. I'll be keen to do some mobility stuff, some lifting stuff. I really want over that weekend to kind of give people as much as I can to offer. I think the business side of things for me, like more than anything, is something that people don't associate with me. But I feel like I've made so many mistakes and learned so many lessons over the last few years that I can help a lot of people with that. And that's one thing that for me, I really want to get across at IFS as well as the things that people love me for my lifting and my ability too so I just want to give as much as possible at that weekend and it's so cool that you can have a, an opportunity just to chat to people and then someone asked you a question I had a business talk a couple of months ago and I was like I don't know the answer to that and then we started discussing it as a group of like 200 personal trainers and like we started hashing it out and I was like that's sick and the party I mean we got we had Charlie Sloth on the decks that first year last year we had Mr. Jam mate so like you were saying, you just want to give everyone everything, right? So last year, wherever I was, James got a picture, sure. James can ask you this, sure. But there were points in the day where there was a little room that I hid in for like 10 minutes just to recharge my batteries. And I go in there and I see Dieran in there. And he's like, bruv, I've done a thousand selfies. I go, bruv, I've done a thousand too. And uh, the, there were these points that were complete fuck. But then when we got to the party, I said, no selfies. And Dieran went, what? I said, no selfies. We're just sending it. 9 p.m. We're sending it. Mm. And I said to anyone dance for James, I was like, no, nah, just enjoy I it. I put my finger on the lips. I go, shh. <laughs> I go, would you rather do a shot with me or have a photo of me? They go, shot. It's like, good answer. And uh, mate, the last thing I remember of the night is Big Luke gave me a crate of Jägermeister little bottles. Yeah. I went out onto the dance floor. I don't remember coming off. <laughs> but this one lad, like the next day at the business talk, was like, do you remember double legging me? I said, what? He goes, mate, you just did a double leg takedown on me out of nowhere. I go, you're right. He goes, yeah, it was fucking hilarious. <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> mate. We went crazy. And it's, it's funny that you mentioned that about the, the selfie thing. Because I think when people meet someone that they really love or follow on social media, they want to get that photo memory. But one thing that I was really reminded of recently when I got locked out of my Instagram in Bali for five days was being present and enjoying the moment. And for five days, I didn't do my story and it's very similar to me like you know capturing that moment this way to show it you actually don't enjoy half the shit that you experience and it really like I keep re reflecting back on that moment to make sure over these next few or the weeks since I've been a lot more present in the situations that I'm in and enjoying the amazing things that I'm experiencing and I think that's very similar to when you meet someone it's very hard to have a genuine conversation now or something that's actually meaningful in conversation that people miss that opportunity with someone that they're really inspired by because they shut it down straight away for the photo yeah but it's, it's quite funny even uh, last week i was walking into this office the guy goes james go have a picture i went good thanks how are you as a joke and he's like oh my god i'm so sorry. i was like mate like if i saw someone who i really admired 
I'd I'd freeze. I wouldn't know. That's the only thing you can ask a, a question with. Hi, mate. Can I get a photo? It's quite funny as well when people go, James, my friends really like you. I'm like, if if you want to talk to me and have five minutes, that's fine. You don't have to open by saying my friend's a big fan or you know whatever. Just come say hello. Yeah. And it is so nice to have those opportunities with people because I remember, I remember back in the day when it was it was me. I remember bumping into Ben Kuma in a petrol station on an away bus to a rugby game. Yeah. And someone was like, who was that? And I was like, you don't know who Ben Kuma is. I was like, that's what it was like. And afterwards, I was like, oh, he was so nice. I chatted to him for a few minutes. And then a few years later, I was like, fuck, I'm the person now that gives a few minutes back. And I love bantering with people. Like when I get their phone, I'm like, oh, Android. Or I'm like, oh, can I wipe your lens or whatever it is. But like you say, it's it's one of those things that's such like an important part of being at events with people. And when we do IFS, I reckon I'm going to get on the mic and be like, 9 p.m., no more phones. Yep. Let's enjoy the night together. Let's just fucking send it and have the best time. Yeah, and it's, like you said, and I said I felt very similar when I was doing the seminars with people, like having that time face-to-face -face with people and actually having that genuine interaction with them, as well as obviously getting the photo, et cetera, but passing on your knowledge or paying it forward in that way is what we do what we do for ultimately. And it is also extremely nice when people do say that, you know, what you've done has had an impact on them. Because even if it's one person, that's the one person that makes you get up the next day and continue to do what you do. Another topic I wanted to talk about today. I need to thank you personally for getting me on TikTok. <laughs> You're loving it, aren't you? It's wild. It's the wild west. I think you probably look at it like a new challenge for you, especially now like Instagram. Well, I have a new girlfriend. <laughs> Well, I just think it's a, a different channel. It's a little bit more exciting and a little bit more carefree. And I've found something similar with that when we've been doing YouTube recently, because we only got 10,000 subscribers on YouTube and we create the content, like there's so much less care in what's going out because I'm like, hardly anyone's going to see this anyway. So I can just put out what I really want to put out rather than what I feel I need to put out. And I think you lose sight of that sometimes as your following grows to stick to doing the things that you love doing. And I feel like you've had the opportunity with TikTok to have that start again and right from the start, do what you love doing. And I think then in that respect, everyone's genuine self comes out. And Lyndall finds the same with TikTok. Her Instagram is very posed. I'm a model. On TikTok, she gets to be a clown because she doesn't care what people think. And it's very difficult when your accounts and socials grow because that thought process to pay more attention to putting out the things that you think people need rather than the things you want to put out becomes apparent, you know? Mate, I, um, I almost had like a full-blown argument with Lockie about this because he's gone fucking YouTube all in. And I was like, that's cool, but YouTube has to be polished. You have to get the thumbnail right. You have to get the title right. And if your production isn't good enough, people will just leave straight away. I'll watch YouTube for five seconds before I fuck it off. I love watching fail compilations. Every yeah. day I watch at least five minutes, people falling over, people, you know, near miss. Near death experiences, my favorite YouTube genre. Someone on a motorbike just misses a car. I'm like, oh, I feel alive. And anyway, <laughs> caffeine's kicking in. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so I've, I'm like on YouTube, that has to be perfect. What I love about TikTok is there are people out there that are just creating content for fun. Exactly. Just as a piss take, there's one account I follow where the girl's boyfriend just turns into a real weirdo and she's laughing away. He's being a weirdo. There's no DSLR cameras. There's no post-production. There's no Premiere Pro. It's two people having a laugh and recording it on a phone. But I think, yeah, the, the biggest part of that is the way it makes you feel. Like when you go on TikTok and you watch, you get enjoyment, you get entertainment, and that makes you feel good. When you're entertained, when you laugh, when you're like, ha look at this and share it and show it with someone – it makes you feel good. It gives you a good stimulus. I feel like you don't get that when you scroll Instagram necessarily. There's a lot of comparing that goes on during the, the scrolling process of Instagram, whereas TikTok, you get that opportunity to actually feel the stimulus of excitement, which you don't get on a lot of other social media. I've never learned so much in my life. Yeah, so much education on there. I mean, I'm on there. Someone says something, I'm like, that can't be true. Or then something will come up about a murder that happened 20 years ago. Something gruesome. 30 seconds in, I go, this, ain't, this can't be real. I Google the name. I'm like, oh my then God. It's part two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's crazy that we people fail to realize. People think it's a dancing app. 
if you think that the average age is below 18, you're an idiot. 52 minutes a day, people are spending on it. Average wow. user. So for every person that spends five minutes on it, someone's spending an hour and a half. Don't test my maths on that. So that, these are the things that excite me. And also for people to be served content on what they like, that's wild. So for you, someone could have watched four weightlifting videos, not know who the fuck you are. At some point you're coming. Mm -hmm. They don't need a friend to tell them because the Chinese Communist Party have got the algorithm. <laughs> it's crazy. And I think a lot of people, I think one thing I'm grateful for is I definitely think the attention I'm getting on TikTok is now bolstering my Instagram. Yeah, you'll definitely be carrying across a completely different demographic from TikTok. But I think the same applies for, for YouTube. They're their own beasts. The Instagram doesn't carry to YouTube. YouTube doesn't carry to TikTok, etc. But the one thing that I do love about YouTube, and I'm very much on the same side with, with Lockie on this, is it allows you to give more long-form education. Because I think like sometimes... For me, especially when you're talking about something that's so technical or you're trying to give someone a further insight into something, in a minute, it's not really possible to do. I agree with this as well. And I think that, you know, uh, actually the last two, my last challenge and then IFS, I did an eight minute sales video where I put it on YouTube and I said, go watch this because they need to have a level of buy-in anyway. And I thought, you know what? If I can send someone from social media to YouTube, if they endure that eight minutes, I can send them straight to a sales page. I created like a new sales funnel that YouTube is, is massive for mate i got recognized three times now you're that tiktoker mixed emotions i'm not sure how i feel about it not walking instagram. through and all of them in australia walk through you're that guy from tiktok i'm like i am that guy from tiktok <laughs> crazy and you've just been sharing your content across there hey mate well I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret i now make content for tiktok and share it to instagram <laughs> there you go mate it's wild but do you know what's annoying sometimes i create what i consider unreal content dead in the water it feels the same on youtube sometimes you know but mate do you know um have you listened to mr beast on joe rogan yeah it was in, it was incredible and do you know what like i think during that conversation like the first half of it me and callum listened together was really frustrating because joe rogan was wanted to talk about him climbing up a fucking mountain and I was like, everyone's here because they want to find out what's inside Mr. What's Beast's the secret? And it was so interesting to hear how pedantic he was with his videos, the, the money he spends on creating them, gets to the point he gets a finished video, and if he doesn't like it, he cans it. There was just, it was just so interesting. But that obsession for... It's inspiring. Yeah, incredible. And people just take it to another fucking level, you know? One thing he said in that as well, where he goes... It's easier to make one video that gets 30 million than it views than it is to make 10 videos that get 5 million. Yeah. And I was like, fuck. I thought about it. I was like... Viral, viral, viral. I just haven't been putting in the effort to single videos. Mm. So that's why I bought the stethoscope, the doctor's outfit, the earpiece. I was like, James, that's $20 on Amazon. Fucking do that. It might make your video a little bit funnier. Stop yeah. being lazy. Or when you have an idea, order the shit and wait three days because I'm impatient as fuck. Yeah. Then listening to that, when he was like, people just aren't making the effort, I was like, why am I recording podcasts on one camera? Went down to our favorite camera store. I'll take a new GH5. GH5 two, how much? Three grand, next stupid question. <laughs> right now, multi-angle motherfucking YouTube video, Sony Webster. Boom, boom, boom. Do you know what? It's interesting you say like, obviously the growth thing for you being like, that was definitely a milestone that you wanted to achieve. But it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on this because... I went to see Phil Graham while I was away and I've always sort of watched him from the sidelines and appreciated his approach and his work. And he's not at all, if from the outside, if you sort of looked in on him, you wouldn't be like, this guy is making what he is making. And he's an extremely fucking successful businessman. And he invited me over to his house. Did you have steak? We had the fucking meat galore. His barbecue is as good as he hypes him to be. But one of the things for me that really hit home in that conversation that I had with him, he said, Sonny, do you want to be rich or do you want to be famous? And it was really interesting when he pitched that to me because I think sometimes there's a chase to, to the levels of fame, but when ultimately you're running a business, it's a very different approach. What's your sort of thoughts on that? He uh, He's also speaking at IFS, by the way. He is. International Business Summit, so if you want to. Uh, 
mate, it's an interesting one. Tim Ferriss actually says this as well. He goes, if you want to be rich and famous, try just being rich. And I was like, rah, rah. And <laughs> he, uh, he says that when he checks into hotels in Asia, he uses a fake name because they would be very quick to sell a database of people that are in there. And people go, oh, this guy's famous. Let's go kidnap him. Kidnap him. So I think he was in Bangkok and he goes, got a phone call. They went, Mr. Ferris, your car's here. He's like, I didn't use that name. So he was like, you know, there are so many downsides to being famous. And even just the things. Now, I cannot go to a festival like I used to. Like, yeah. I can't say things I used to. I can't, you're always worried about who you're talking to, what people's intentions are, whatever. Whereas I think that if you're just wealthy, you know, you can, you can get away with it. And it is an interesting question, but for me, I suppose I have to draw back to kind of like my mission. What am I looking to do? I'm trying to eradicate nonsense, help educate people, get people to, you know, not listen to misinformation. I have to use that fame trail to get to those people. To reach more people. And, and, People listening, they're like, oh, yeah. but that that is actually an element of falling on your sword, because this is going to fuck so many elements of my life. Yeah. Million followers, so many people are like, that's amazing. I was like, yeah, there's also a lot of things that aren't amazing about having a million followers. You know, uh, the girl I'm seeing at the moment, she just got like a thousand followers the other day. Sat with her, and it's not that I try and hide her, but I want her to have privacy in her life. The lengths people had gone to to find her, it's yeah. actually she's actually like a little bit like, what the fuck's happening? Yeah, and so you have that element to it and for me I don't particularly want to be famous I didn't ever want that as a kid you know Kanye West he wanted to be famous like that's yeah. all he wanted I didn't want that with the wealth thing I never really wanted to be well off or wealthy but I suppose there's almost like a, a split through the middle where I'm going to be able to reach my mission best yeah but and this I think just to dive into that point a little bit more that you made there about having a mission statement I think that that more than anything is the first thing that someone needs to decide before they worry about whether they want to be rich or whether, whether they want to be famous. Because I think a lot of the time you can lose track easily of what your sole purpose is or what your core values are. And as long as that's always the driving force with whatever you do, I think those two things will either be a byproduct, you know, whereas I think sometimes when you're driven towards the fame or the money like you can very easily lose sight of the the reason why you do what you do and i think if you do what you do and you love it and you're passionate about it those two things will eventually be a byproduct because then you're completely right if i lose wealth i'm still fine because i can still continue my mission if i lose fame i'm still fine i can still continue my exactly. mission when people tie themselves a lot to something i just want to be famous they get there now what i just want to be wealthy they get there now what and here's an interesting thing. I've written this in my next book, How to Be Confident, pre-order now. I think I've been wrong about passion sometimes. So a lot of people say you need to find passion and go after passion. I've actually been reading a bit of Simon Sinek's work on this. Not all the time should people follow their passion. They should follow their values. And if you follow your values, which is actually what I did as a personal trainer, it's what you did as a weightlifting coach. You wanted to do something that aligned with your personal values of what we found fulfilling. Passion came as a byproduct later. Mm. Two years in, you're getting out of bed on a Monday, like, let's go. And you're like, what's this weird feeling I've got going through my veins? I'm passionate. But you didn't start off by following your passion. You started off by following your values. Yeah, it's a great point, you know. Clip and that. <laughs> Clip that TikTok ain't gonna be ready for that. Let me tell you that now. I'm looking straight down the eyes of that camera. And if you're listening to this, you're missing out on YouTube. Yeah, it's it's a very valid point. And for me, like finding your values, I think, and the core things that that bring you as a byproduct passion sometimes can take people a long time to discover. But I was saying to to Lindell the other day because we were talking about lots of people starting CrossFit and getting into a new sport. I think a lot of people are fearful to try something new, whether it be a hobby or something that they potentially could be passionate about because they already have a fear of failing before they even get into something. And I think that's such a sad thing that people have that, that they go through before they try something new. Mate, there are so many of these topics that I've written about in the, the current or the latest book that I'm doing. And there's an interesting guy, uh, David Robson, I think his name is. His book's coming to my house today 
Chris Williamson had him on the podcast and he wrote an email about it, which got me listening to the podcast. People's expectations definitely influences their outcomes. We've always known this, but he starts bringing it together with data. So I started researching into other data about this and I looked at the amount of people that were in the vaccine trials that had negative, really bad side effects that weren't given the vaccine. They were injected with nothing. And yet they were like nauseous, they were feeling ill, they're dizzy, they're like, oh my God, you know, I feel so sick. What they were expecting is what their physiology, physiology predicted. It's a bit like when you take a painkiller. Even uh, Lucy Lord's sister once, uh, I strained my meniscus once. She goes, put a plaster on it. I said, why? She goes, it make you feel better. And I was like, what the fucking fuck? But the same is if people have a fear of failure, they're almost manifesting the outcome before they've even tried. Similar yeah. to, oh, here you go, here's a fucking one for you. If you expect to fail a lift, there's no fucking way you're getting that lift. And one of my best deadlifts ever was when I forgot to add the weight of the bar. Yeah, is, exactly. And I always say to people that if you you're not a, if you don't believe or see that you can do the lift before you try it, you might as well not bother. Might as well fucking unrack your weights now, you bastard. But just going back there a little bit to just dive into like what we were saying about you do jujitsu and when you started jujitsu probably one of the most satisfying things was having to learn and fail at something when you become successful or very good at anything that you do that satisfaction disappears a lot with with what you do i don't get the same out of weightlifting as i do it's enjoyable but i'm very good at doing that thing whereas the satisfaction i get from i went and tried boxing the other day and trying to learn the footwork and sucking at it was so fucking enjoyable in the same way it's struggling at golf is and it's just always remembering that that working shit out process and the journey is the best part of any new endeavor that you make mate you know i'm currently addicted to tennis yeah it's me willits uh even ferris cam we were all so dog shit and people jumping in straight away going you need lessons i was like no we're figuring it out i look back at my playing a couple months ago i'm cringing now i'm top spinner mcgee i got a new racket oh, come at gear. me <laughs> come at me like the other day even playing with my missus it took us an hour and five Play minutes mate she's unreal <laughs> she just sounded right she's an athlete at everything but we we played for 65 minutes to win the first match mm. and i'm sweating i'm loving it but i love competitive shit if i if we draw at tennis because we've run out of time We'll go back and when she's cooking, I get the chessboard out. I'm like, let's fucking go. And there's a beauty in not being good at things that people overlook. So many people don't play chess. I don't know the rules. Well, fucking learn them. Get on YouTube, it'll take you five minutes. Oh, I'm not very good at tennis. It's a simple game. You're just going to be shit and you're going to spend half your time chasing balls, right? Oh yeah. But same with weightlifting. You know, once you can lift the bar and, you know, add weight to it, I think you're completely right. You get to a point where after that bell curve runs out, things aren't as enjoyable as they were before, but you can't lose sight of how good it is to be an amateur. No, and that's one of the biggest things I think that stops people getting into Olympic weightlifting or trying trying it in itself or even trying CrossFit because of the it seems from the outside like such a difficult thing to, to start doing. And what are the repercussions of missing a lift? Do you get to go again? Exactly, same. <laughs> the, the only thing that I don't like about boxing, I've done it a bit, is... I yeah, don't like punch. the repercussions of failing. Yeah. So if I throw one, leave my glove down, I'm getting twatted. In jiu-jitsu, you're getting some mitts fine. You get a, a, a limb stretched or you get compression on your neck to the point you're going to pass out and you tap. Like, you can fail so much in jiu-jitsu. You can fail every day. There's no trauma to your brain. There's no impact. And very rarely some injuries. With boxing and striking, like, you don't check a leg kick in like Muay Thai or something no, well, that, what like, did you think of Tyson Fury's latest fight because he reckons that's him done now he's a class athlete I love these thick guys you know just coming out Tyson Fury's like I'm the best boxer in the world when Andy Ruiz knocked down AJ I was a bit there's a bit of me inside the thick boy club you know I, I love it <laughs> I love to see it there's a guy on TikTok shock uh, who does a backflip and roller skates and he's got a bit of a belly and he's like this is an athletic male physique whether you like it or not and I, I love that shit. Um, I'd love to see Tyson Fury box game because he's a real entertainer, similar to, uh, you know, so many UFC fighters that are entertaining, like Conor McGregor, right? I'm well into my UFC at the moment. This week, we've got Gaethje Oliveira. Does that mean anything to you? He knows. He knows. <laughs> you know anything about that? No. Do you know what? The last few years, I got into it like politics as well. I'm more interested in American politics than anything else. But anyway, with the UFC, Conor McGregor, you watch him on Instagram, his success has made him very weak. I don't think he's got a comeback in him. 
if he they're he's not hungry anymore. This is it. And some people have said like he might get a title fight with Oliveira who's fighting this weekend against Justin Gaethje. He has no right to go into that fight. But my God, if that fight happens, I'll get goosebumps thinking about it. Again, he's an entertainer, you know, and people love to see it. Hey, like, I can't I can't get enough of it. I'm getting all excited now <laughs> thinking about it. You're off to America in what? How many weeks? Three weeks. Three weeks till we go, yeah. It's been probably Flying to LA. Yeah, five years since I've been there. I'm trying to do a lot of collabs this time around. I want to like spend a lot of time meeting great people and having conversations with good people, learning from them. Like for every time that I've traveled before, I've just literally been seen the place, done the seminar and gone. Whereas this time, like the seminars are going to be incredible. We're going to LA, San Diego, San Fran, um, Austin, Cleveland, New York, Miami, you know, a bunch of places. But in every one of those places, there's some incredible people. And I want to hopefully get the opportunity to have conversations with these people, um, share my knowledge, share their knowledge to my audience as well, and, and make the most of the trip in, in that way. So a lot of people listening to this probably heard you on Fair Points, probably followed you for a while. This is your perfect opportunity to tell them about what you're doing, where they can come to you, where they should go. If someone's listening to this, they're going, oh, I've heard a different side of Sunny today. What? Start your sales funnel. <laughs> Get your sales funnel going. Like I said, for, for me, face-to-face, -face, the only thing I do now mainly is the seminars. We've got the US tour coming up in all those locations that I just mentioned. I do do Olympic way of thing coaching. I help people start from absolute scratch with zero experience. Yeah, look at that camera. Learn how to yeah, do Olympic weightlifting correctly right from the start on a one-to-one -one basis. We're the most premium online weightlifting community in Good the world. Good adjective. <laughs> And uh, we'll be doing a fair point, so you'll probably be hearing from me in a few days anyway. Well, yeah, exactly. The fair points this weekend, I think, is going to be massive. There's some huge topics that I want to talk about um, on a little bit more of a deeper side, as we do in fair points, from a little bit of a depression that I've had over the last sort of few months. I want to dive Fucking hell, he leaves that to the end of the podcast. <laughs> he fucking leaves that to the end but of the I podcast. I want to dive into it with the, with the boys on okay. fair points, so I think that's a great plug to, to come into. Obviously, the travel, Ferris has just done... Did he complete it? Oh, fuck him, mate. <laughs> fuck him. This ain't his podcast, is it? Yeah, we're going to have lots of good things to talk about this weekend, so make sure you come listen on Fair Points. Cool. At Sonny Webster, GB. All his links will be in his bio. You'll be part of his honey trap. Thank you very much, Sonny Webster. Big love.